Amen. Well, isn't it good to be in church this morning? Yeah. Amen. Good to be in church and with the people of God and the house of God. And uh, it's always so good to give this day to the Lord. It's the Lord's day and it's good to start out the week being refreshed by worship and by the Word of God. Uh, you know, I'm always here. I hardly ever miss a Sunday. And uh, I'm glad to see you here this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1, verse 35. I want to begin there this morning. And I want, I want to talk to you this morning about how the church grows. Now, I'm not talking about One Life Church. I'm talking about the church, the body of Christ, how the church grows. And you probably already know in advance that I'm going to tell you that you have a part to play in how the church grows. Uh, it's not just... It's not just miraculous, of course it is supernatural and God's involved, but you know, I want to know what our part is um, and, and concerning how the church grows, amen? Don't you want to know your part? That's important. So we're going to start in John chapter 1 verse 35, and before we get there, I want to just bring you this thought because I've, I remember growing up always hearing about the 12 disciples, which there were a lot more disciples than just 12, but you know, the 12 disciples that eventually became the 12 apostles. I've always thought it was interesting because you think of this group of 12 men. These are like supposed to be the elite, you know, believers of the time, right? And these are like Jesus's 12 helpers, his 12 partners, if you want to say it that way. They're with him everywhere he goes, helping him with everything he does. And I've often thought to myself, how did Jesus pick the 12? You know, did he hand select each one? You know, did he know them before they were born? Did, were they called to do this from the beginning of time? How did that happen that these 12 men found themselves surrounded by Jesus? Well, let's look at it. I want to show you at least a couple examples. John chapter 1, verse 35. John the Baptist, of course, has been preaching about the coming of Jesus for, you know, for years at this point, letting everybody know the Bible. So he's preparing the way for Jesus to come. So he's been preaching and preaching. And finally, Jesus shows up on the scene. So verse 35, it says, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. So notice John had disciples as well. He was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And, and, and before this, a few verses before this, he, he makes a statement. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 37, the two disciples, that, those were John's disciples, the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Now, just a couple points that I want to make from this. First of all, this is the first time in Scripture that this revelation has ever come out that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, that was not clearly laid out in the Old Testament. You couldn't have really, no one had made that connection that the lambs being sacrificed in the Old Testament correlated with the Son of God who would be slain for the sins of man. Now, you know that. If you're a believer, you know that as common knowledge. Jesus is the lamb that was slain, takes away the sin of the world. You know that. Probably you've heard it a million times. But this is the first time that anybody had ever had that revelation. Jesus walks by. John sees him, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God showed him that. Just in that moment, he had a revelation, and God showed John the Baptist that. Now, John's whole ministry has been about promoting Jesus. His whole ministry had been about pr promoting the Messiah. Now, now, Jesus was living, actually, he and John were related. And so Jesus was living at the time when, when John's doing all of his preaching, but John didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah in the beginning. He's preaching about this one that's going to come after me. He didn't know it was Jesus. You know, being his cousin or related to him, he probably had, you know, family meals with Jesus. He probably had played, you know, sticks and stuff. I don't know. John was an odd character. I don't know if he'd played balls. He, he ate locusts and stuff. So I don't know. He, he might not have been a normal child. But if he was, then, you know, he, he would have saw Jesus. He would have interacted. So his whole ministry has been about preaching about the Messiah, the one who's going to come and fill, fulfill all the Old Testament prophecy. Then one day, he has this revelation that that person he's been preaching about is Jesus. Can you imagine the shock that would have come to his mind of like, wait a minute, my cousin is the Messiah? You know, that would have been hard for him to accept, but he's so overwhelmed with it. God showed him that, 
And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And immediately his whole perspective about Jesus was changed. No longer is he just cousin Jesus. Now he's the Messiah. And he sees him in a whole different light. So John had given his life to this ministry. Now he's trained his disciples. He's got disciples that are following him. And so when he says, behold, the Lamb of God, two of his disciples leave him and go follow Jesus. How do you think that made him feel? I mean, how would you feel? Wait a minute. I trained you. I taught you. I raised you up. And now all of a sudden I make this statement, you leave me and you go follow Jesus right on the spot. What am I, chopped liver? You know, he would have felt, you know, kind of betrayed in a sense. But you would think he felt that way. But honestly, John didn't feel that way because John was perfectly fine. He'd been preparing them. He said, look, the more he increases, the more I must decrease. The more he's pushed into the front, the more I'm going to fade into the background. This isn't about me. This is what my whole ministry has been about is this moment. If y'all want to leave me and follow him, go for it. I don't care. It doesn't bother me one bit. This man put the kingdom of God first. He put Jesus first. He put the call first, the mission first. It was not about him. Sadly, we don't see that a lot in people today. Most people would have been offended, but John didn't care. He didn't care if all his disciples left and went to follow Jesus. So, but notice, these two disciples heard him say this, and they followed him. Let's pick up in verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother. The other disciple, it doesn't tell us who it is, but if you study it, most theologians believe that it was John the Apostle, not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle. He had a disciple named John. So Andrew and John followed Jesus. It says one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now think about this. So far, we have three disciples that are following Jesus that were not actually called by Jesus. In other words, Jesus did not go up to them and say, Follow me. The first two are following him because of something they heard John say. Basically, John made a proclamation about Jesus, and so Andrew and the apostle John follow Jesus. Jesus didn't look at them and say, come and follow me. He did that to other disciples, but he didn't do that to these two. Then we have Peter, who is probably the most well-known disciple. Jesus did not call him. How did he get to Jesus? How did he become a disciple? Look at what it says. He was Andrew's brother. So he said, he first went and found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, and he brought him to Jesus. Peter was brought to Jesus because of Andrew, because Andrew went to him. He was somebody that, of course, Peter trusted and knew. It was his brother. He went to him, and he said, man, we have found the Messiah. They are Jewish people. They, they, like all Jewish people, they were looking for the Messiah, you know, to different degrees. Some people really looking. Some people just kind of halfway looking, but they were Jewish people, and they knew about the Messiah. And Andrew went, and he said, Peter, we have found the Messiah. Come and see. Come and look. So Peter comes, and as soon as he comes, Jesus looks at him and he says, You are Simon, son of John. He doesn't even have to introduce himself. Jesus already knows who he is. You are Simon, son of John, and you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Look at the same chapter, down verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. So Philip gets a direct call from Jesus. So, so far, how many disciples we got? Y'all keeping track? Four. Three of them were not called directly by Jesus. One of them was. It was Philip. So he finds Philip and he says, Philip, follow me. Philip gets called directly. Then in verse 44, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And so Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and all the prophets wrote about. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So Nathanael was a little bit of a racist. You know, he's got to get saved and he's got to work on him because he's, 
Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It'd be like maybe some of y'all say, I'm from Forest Hill area. It'd be like some of us say, man, can anything good come out of Glenmore? I mean, come on, you know, it's... Now, we love people from Glenmore. If you're from there, it's fine. I'm just... But that's what Nathaniel... Look at how Nathaniel's approach is. Philip comes and he said, hey, man, we found Jesus. He's from Nazareth. He goes, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, well, come and see. So Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, wait a minute, before who called you? Philip. Philip brought Nathanael to Jesus. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of of Israel. So now, where are we at now? Five? Five disciples. Four of the five were called by somebody else. Only one of the five so far was directly called by Jesus. Every other one, somebody went and found them and shared with them their experience and their testimony. They went up to them and said, look, we have found true life. We have found the Messiah. Would you just come and see? Even skeptics like Nathaniel who said... Can't nothing good come out of Nazareth. He said, come and see. Just come and see. He didn't try to argue with him. He didn't try to debate theology. He didn't try to prove upon scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. He just said, come and see, because I know if you can see him, I know if you can get to him, that you'll see what I see, that maybe God will touch you, and you'll have an experience with him like I had. And so four out of the five came in a, in a way that you might not expect. It was not Jesus calling them directly let me ask you this question how many in the body of Christ today I'm talking about at large worldwide how many have come to the kingdom of God exactly like this how many have come just like this just little by little somebody said hey man why don't you come to church with me hey have you heard about Jesus somebody just shared with somebody they knew a friend notice they're not they're not going down the street finding strangers. I know that's kind of our mentality sometimes when we think about sharing the gospel. Or, or it was back in the 80s, you know, or the 90s. Like you got to go out on the street and tell random people that you don't know about Jesus. Just go up to complete strangers and, and say, hey, do you know Jesus? If you died tonight, where would you go? <laughs> it's like, whoa, can you, can you ask me how my day was first before we start talking about eternity? A little uh, aggressive. Little, little great, aggressive. Well, if that's your personality, hey, Nothing wrong with that. Maybe you can do that. But I would dare say the vast majority of people uh, are not comfortable walking up to a complete stranger and asking them if they're going to hell or not. You know, that's just a little bit strange. Uh, but if you do that, man, and God uses you to do that, great. But that's actually not what we see here, is it? They didn't go down the street finding strangers. These were all people they knew. Some of them were related. Some of them were friends. They just went up to the people that was in their circle and they said... This is the experience that I've had with Jesus. Why don't you come and see? Why don't you come and meet him for yourself? And I believe that this is the way that the church grows. Now, you have other examples in Scripture. For example, on the day of Pentecost, where 3,000 people were saved in a moment. But how many times have you seen that happen? That's, that's more of the exception, not the rule. We know that God can save large amounts of people you know, in a, in a single moment, in a single event. Again, uh, 3,000 people on the, were saved on the day of Pentecost. We see another day where 5,000 people were saved. And this was the beginning of the church. You know, the church exploded right at the beginning. But after that, what you really see is you don't just see thousands of people coming in one moment. That's more of the exception than it is the rule. And I'm going to tell you this. If you sit around waiting for that, then you're missing out on your part that you're able to contribute to the kingdom of God. Because I can guarantee you that there are people in your life right now, in your circle right now, that need you to be a Philip to them, that need you to be an Andrew to them, which is to just go say, hey, I've experienced this. Why don't you come and see? Why don't you come and see what God is doing? And there's no, you don't have to be a salesman. All right? You don't have to be some high-pressured salesman trying to sell Jesus or sell the gospel. But you know what? There are people in your life that trust you. There are people in your life that look up to you. They know your character. They watch your life. And just because you say 
this is what I've experienced. Why don't you come and see? Just at your word alone, they'll probably try it out because they trust you. They believe in you. And that's, that's the case here. I believe Peter came to see the Messiah because he trusted his brother Andrew. It was his brother. And his brother said, come and see. He said, okay. Nathaniel, who was already a skeptic, he came too. And it was just because he trusted Philip, who was a close friend. So, you know, we like the flood, but it's really the just constant drip that is actually more effective over time. And that's what we see in these examples. That's the way that I believe the vast majority of people come to Jesus Christ. In our day, you know, we've got something called viral videos. You know, somebody, and boy, the stuff that goes viral and the stuff that, you, that catches traction blows your mind. You know, something that actually matters. You'll have like 300 people watch it, and you get a kitten that falls in a toilet or something like that, and it just everybody's watching it and sharing it. Uh, that's because we have so many people that hate cats. You know, they fall in the toilet, they like to watch it. That's, at least that's how I see it. But, uh, you know, you get these videos, they catch traction. And how does it, how does it happen? Well, it's, it, it's the drip. It's not the flood. It's I saw it. I thought it was funny. I send it to you. You know, you watch it. Yeah, oh, that was funny. You send it to a couple people. They watch it. They think it's funny. They send it to a couple people. Before you know it, it's just, it's just spreading around, and it's all by this factor. And before you know it, 300 million people have watched something and, and viewed it and been impacted by something, no matter how nominal it may have been. They've been impacted by it, and it's all come just by one person sharing it to another. The gospel is viral, and the gospel should be viral. Let me tell you why <clears throat> the gospel, in a lot of ways, has not had more traction, it's because we have not been committed to share it in this way. We've not been committed to say to to talk to those people that are in our circle of influence. Let me give you an, let me give you another example. Let me say it another way. One time, this was several years ago, I was on staff at another church. Uh, somebody that was very popular put out a book that was incorrect. The doctrine in the book was incorrect. And it was basically teaching people that there was no hell, that hell did not exist. And somebody that I was uh, discipling and working with, they came to me and they said, man, we got to do something about this. You know, we got we to write something. We got to put something out to show people that this isn't right, you know, and, and we got to get the word out that this is wrong, this isn't right. And I remember having a conversation with him and I said, you know, we're, we're, we are called to influence those that are in our circle of influence from the platform that God has given you. At that time, and, and, and certainly now as well, uh, God has not given me a national platform to speak on any kind of big subject. Now, I'm not going to go out and try to impact the world because I don't have that platform. But you know what? There are people that do have that platform, and they are the ones that are called to speak out on this, not me. I'm called to speak out in my circle of influence, and at that time, it might have just been 10 people that I was called to pull in and say, hey, look at this. This isn't right. This isn't the Word of God. And I would address that with those just handful of people that's in my circle, of my circle of influence. Well, everybody in here has a different size circle of influence or platform that God has given you. And so, no, you're not called in that sense to reach the world as we think about. Probably nobody in here has that level of platform. But you do have a circle of influence, whether it's five people, whether it's 10, whether it's 50, whether it's 500. And let me ask you, are there people in your circle that need to know Jesus Christ? It's not your responsibility to cause them to be born again or have an encounter with God. It's not your responsibility, but it is your responsibility to share with them what you've experienced. And if you're in this room this morning, I believe it's because you've experienced something. I don't know to what degree you've experienced it. You know, I know I've had a powerful experience with God when I was a young man, and I've had several subsequent ones. I don't know if you're here because, well, you were just raised in church. I don't know if you're here because maybe you have some kind of sense of duty, like you have to be here. I don't know. But I do believe every person in this room is here because you've experienced something with God. And all I'm telling you is if you can just be faithful to share that with other people, 
Just be faithful to those that are in your, your, your sphere of influence to say, man, have you, have, you, have you tried this? Why don't you come to church with me? Why don't you come try church? Why don't you come and listen you know, to the word of God? And then from there, if they say yes, you know, then the rest is God. The rest is God's part. But you have to be faithful to do your part. In a sense, we are partnering with God in this effort. In a sense, we partner with the Holy Spirit in this effort. I think a lot of people don't reach out to people in their sphere of influence because they have no faith in the Holy Spirit to actually do His work. A lot of Christians go through their life, they never even think about the Holy Spirit. They never think about God being with them. But if you're a believer, did you know you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you? So everywhere you go, He goes. Everywhere you go, He goes. That means if you're at Walmart, if you're at work, if you are anywhere, the Holy Spirit is in you, and He's, he's thinking about that person that you're interacting with. He's not just thinking about you. He knows everything about their life. He knows their past. He knows their future. He knows everything about them. And sometimes all he needs is a vessel that will just open their mouth and let the Holy Spirit start to work. You don't know, have to have the right words to say. You don't have to have some great, you know, uh, pre-planned speech. But can you, just, can you just open that door and start that conversation? I've seen it time and time again where God will use it to impact somebody's life. You know... I remember when I was in high school that I had such a passion for God and I was so vocal about, you know, my faith and I was always looking for opportunities to share the gospel in somebody's life. And when I say share the gospel, okay, I don't mean like preach. I just mean incept anything to do with God, anything to do with Jesus, just some way to introduce it into the conversation because I would see that when you did that, that, that it would just blossom, and God would take the whole thing and make it grow. It was amazing how God would do that. And I remember, this is, this is honest to God's truth, I remember sitting in class in high school, and I was in sociology class or history class or whatever, and I'd be sitting there and I'd be thinking to myself, uh, okay, because sometimes we'd have discussions in class, and I'd be thinking to myself, all right, when it comes for discussion time, how, what can I say? What can I bring up that will steer the conversation towards God? What can I say or do that will steer it towards the things of God? That's probably why I didn't do real good on my ACT. You know, I, I wasn't really thinking about school too much. But I just was thinking about it. And so many times it would happen. A conversation would come up about you know, sociology or something, and, and it'd come my turn to speak, and I would just say something that you know, meant something to me. And man, before you knew it, the whole conversation, we were discussing the things of God in class. And I just laughed to myself because I'm thinking, man, the Holy Spirit, he, all he needs is an inch. He just, needs a, he just needs a little bit of wiggle room to work his way in and start working in people's lives. Did y'all ever read that book when y'all were, uh, you know, kids? Get, if you give a mouse a cookie, then he'll want a glass of milk, you know, or whatever. I think they, they changed it now. If you give a pig a pancake, then, you know, he'll want some syrup or something like that. What's wrong with y'all? Yeah, nobody read that book. I mean, I can't be the only one. Surely y'all got kids in here. Y'all know that book, right? Okay. Well, they changed it. Now, if you give a pig a pancake, which I think is great. I like that one better. If you give a pig a pancake, he might want some syrup too. But it's like that with the Holy Spirit. If you let him work and you, you just do that little bit, then he's going to come in and he's, it's going to start to spread and he's going to use it to work. I mean, you don't want to live boring Christianity, do you? You don't want to just live a life where you never take any risk. You never see God move. I mean, do we serve a God that is full of power? Do we serve a God that is still alive, that's still doing anything in the planet today? Or do we just serve a God that's silent and never does anything? I mean, when I read through the book of Acts, I see God partnering with his people, moving, working constantly. All the time. Every day was a new adventure where they never know what they were going to get into. They never knew if this day they were going to get beat with rods and arrested or if they were going to have success preaching and 3,000 people were going to get saved. They didn't know. It was a new adventure every day working with God. And I'm telling you, so many believers have completely lost that, don't expect that, don't care about that. They just go through their day and I'm going to do my thing and live my life. It's all going to be go, you know, over and I'm going to retire and then here comes the grave. You know, well, that's a lot to look forward to. No, I think, that, I think that Christianity is supposed to be a little bit more potent than what we might be experiencing sometimes. But I can tell you that we are the limiting factor because God has not changed. 
God has not changed. It's the same Holy Spirit, same power, same God. We are the limiting factor. Now, I'm going to tell you, I am not trying to transform you this morning, okay? If you walked in here one way, I'm under no illusion that you're going to walk out of here like a totally different person than you've been for the last 45 or 50 years. I get that. But what if you could just turn the dial just a little bit in the right direction? Is a sliding scale. You know, you got somebody over here that they're like a stone, just dead, and they don't ever do nothing. And then you got somebody over here that they're, they're, you know, they're like John the Baptist, just bold and talking to strangers and all that. Okay, wherever you're at in that scale, I understand we're not going to transform you this morning, but could we just move the dial a little bit? If we just move the dial a little bit and every person and people start to wake up and go, yeah, maybe the Holy Spirit wants to work through me to work in people's lives, could that make a difference in your family, in your job, in your city, in the people that you're around? I, I guarantee you that it can, and uh, it's something that you can grow in. Look at this, Acts chapter 2, verse 44. This is what you see in the early church. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, there was something about the early church that was contagious. It was, it was daily. Now, I don't think it was daily because they were having church daily. I think it was daily because people were doing what I'm talking about this morning daily. People were reaching other people daily. It was happening on a daily basis. What happens when the church does not do this? What happens when the church does not reach out with a little bit of passion and a little bit of fire like we're talking about this morning? Well, first of all, the church stagnates. You ever seen a stagnant pool of water where there's no flow coming in, there's no flow going out, it's just a, a pond or a pool of water that just stagnates? It, it just begins to get nasty and it begins to get, you know, gross. There's no, you know, true life-giving uh, element to it. And that's what happens to the church when we don't, when we don't give out of what's being poured into us, what's been done to us, we become like a stagnant pool of water. We become dead. There's no life. And you can see this in the church at large in a lot of ways. What happens also? What, what's another thing that happens? Well, we become like the Pharisees. If you read through the scripture, there's this group of people that Jesus was always talking about called the Pharisees. And they were very religious and they had a lot of religious activities that they did. And, and they actually knew the Word of God really well. As far as knowing the Bible, they probably knew it better than just about anybody else. But they did not have the heart of God. And they lost that fire. They lost that passion that they should have had. So they were actually doing more harm than good. Did you know it's not called the Pharisees? But we have people in the body of Christ. We have churches today that are just like the Pharisees. They know the Bible, they do all the religious duties, but there's no life on the inside of them. And it actually does more harm than good, I believe. It actually does more harm than good. We, we need to take the gospel and what we've experienced with God and make it part of our normal life. It doesn't need to be over here in this separate category. Okay? If, you can, if you can take what God has done in your life and put it over here in this separate category, there might be a problem. And what I mean by that is, it's like over here, we've got work, family, our hobbies, you know, and our friends, and, and, and God's really no part of it whatsoever. But then there's one little category way over here, occasionally we'll go and jump over here and, and take part in this little category where God is at, and then we'll, you know, jump back to this, this category over here. God, that is not the type of relationship that God wants to have with His people. If anything, your category should be God, and you're incorporating family into it. You're incorporating hobbies into it. You're incorporating work into it. The, your whole category and life existence should be 
in God. And you say, well, that's, that's not me. I don't feel that way. Well, I'm not trying to bring you down this morning. I'm not trying to condemn you this morning. Again, I'm just trying to turn the dial just a little bit. Can you, can you turn the dial this morning, move the scale a little bit and go, you know, I need to incorporate God more into my life. You don't have to, walk, you don't have to feel bad and walk out of here today like a totally changed person. But I do think that the Word of God should move us. There's something wrong if every time we hear the Word of God, we leave with just our mind going, mm, you know, that was good, but it really has no effect at all uh, on daily application. I mean, we should hear the Word of God and say, yeah, I, I want to adjust, I want to change. And I'm, that's what I'm praying for and believing for you this morning, that if we're going to see the body of Christ grow, we've got to adopt this mentality. And I want to challenge you with this, too. Life is so short. Life is so short, and it's going to be over like that. And all the stuff that we've spent working for and trying to build and trying to do, it's just going to disappear. It's going to burn up. It's not really going to mean a lot in a lot of ways. But what's going to stand and what's going to last, when you cross over into eternity and you look back on your life, there's going to be so much that you go, I really wish I had given more time to God. I really wish I had lived more for God because now I see the importance of it. I see the importance of eternity and other people's eternity. The challenge is living every day with that perspective. The challenge is living every day with that eternal perspective going, wait a minute, do I really need to sacrifice everything so that I can have some stuff? Or do I need to be living for God? Because sometimes they don't, sometimes they conflict. And sometimes decisions in our life conflict. And you, when you have this perspective, you can go, wait a minute, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm actually just passing through here. And I'm going, I'm on my way somewhere else. When you've been in eternity for 10,000 years, are you even going to be able to remember the 80 or 90 that you were here? It's, it's going to be so hard to remember. I mean, I've, I've kind of thought how it would be funny, you know, somebody from your... Your, your past here on earth coming up to you in heaven. Hey, you remember when we were back on earth that one time, you know, we were fishing or something like that? And you say, no, I just, I can't even remember it. It had been 10,000 years ago. Man, I don't even hardly remember that. And I, I believe that's how it's going to be. It's just, and so, but, but now when you're here, it's like this is all we have. This is everything. And, and you put all the focus there. But the Bible teaches us to live with an eternal perspective. The Bible teaches us to live with eternity in view and in mind, and it actually should have an impact on what you do each day. I believe that. I believe it should impact the decisions you make. It should, it should have such an impact on you that things you would have done, you didn't do. Decisions you would have made, you didn't make. I, I believe that. I believe you should, it should have that level of impact on you. It does not need to be just a passing thought that has no impact on your daily decisions. It, that is not right. That's not what we see in the Bible. It should impact the decisions that you make. That's what we see in Scripture. Amen? Praise God. Let's stand on our feet this morning.